face coverings and social distancing. Both will be with us for the rest of the year as we learn more about the coronavirus. I sat down with the Medical Director of Infectious Diseases, Dr. John Bradley, to learn more about what doctors are learning about this novel virus and how it's changing the way we live. Dr. Bradley, always so good to see you. Some really important things came up uh, in the news over the past few days. Uh, one of the first ones I wanted to talk about because it's something that we had streamed live, we were watching it, was Rady Children's Hospital and coming online with this testing uh, that they want to do a lot more with the kids. Yes. Tell me all about this. This seems exciting. So it is. Uh, we now have enough machines and enough capacity and enough people to run the tests that we can literally do up to 2,000 a day. A day. A day. A day. Uh, we're getting new machines all the time. Uh, uh, so, so what we're trying to do now, the hospital with the county is trying to link our capacity uh, as it grows, because we, we're fine for the patients. As I've told you, every kid that comes in gets tested, every kid with a procedure, every kid with a surgery, every kid with a runny nose, we've, we've met that goal probably three, four weeks ago. And now we have the opportunity to bring in more tests so that we can now test uh, the families of these kids, mom, dad, siblings, when they come into the clinics. Uh, when kids come in for a well checkup, you know, no symptoms at all. We can test those and that's part of the program. Uh, so for, for the, Right now, for all of the pediatric health care providers, uh, some of them are linked directly with us, some are linked with the county, but everyone will be able to test their children and siblings and parents for coronavirus. And this will get us probably, if you look at all the children that see all the health care practitioners in the county each day, we're, we, we clearly get up to that 2,000 number. And the county would like to know of kids that come in for well checkups, are, are any of them sick with COVID, even if it's mild sickness? And, and as we've discussed many times, the kids can have such mild symptoms that the kids aren't complaining, they feel well, and parents just bring them in for their appointment for their immunizations. Um, and now we'll get a glimpse to see if if one in 500 or one in a thousand of those kids is actually positive, a very low rate or one in 10, but, but that kind of going out and checking all the well people, all the well children and their families is unique. And it's a collaboration between the county and our hospital that's also being duplicated with some of the other healthcare systems like Kaiser. This sounds like a bit of a game changer for San Diego. Yes, it, it, it will give us the best ability to look at how much disease is spreading in the community. And, and we've, we've worried that kids are spreading it between themselves and social distancing and the lockdown of the schools and all have really prevented child to child contact. So we don't think it's being spread. This will give us a current assessment of the, of the prevalence of, of coronavirus infection in, in well children and their families. And this helps the county because the county now looks at the statistics and they go, do we have a problem or are we doing really well? And even more importantly, as we go from one stage to the next in, in, in taking people out of lockdown, if we, if we open up daycares and schools, and we repeat this study after schools are open, do we see that there's like a lot more coronavirus circulating? Was that the right decision to open things up or should we have kept them closed? So, so it's an ongoing process of looking at where we are now and the impact of all of these restrictions and mandates that the county has done to protect us all. And as we, as we lift up and go to the beach and go to the parks and ride our bikes and stuff, um, we'll be able to see if, if we're working well, if, if those lifting of restrictions 
is not bringing with it consequences of increased spread and, and new deaths. We've talked about it a few times here about how COVID and coronavirus spreads from person to person. This morning in, in our show, and we're going to include this in our news tomorrow, there was a doctor from UC San Diego who um, did a study or released a report, and I, I know we've talked about peer-reviewed stuff many times, but uh, has gotten some attention that he said that you need more than a six feet distance. Six feet's not enough. What he's saying along with, uh, I believe it was a researcher in China that um, it's lingering in the air as an, as an aerosol and reiterated the importance of masks um, to help reduce the spread, but said six feet's not enough. What have you heard? So we've, there are a lot of people looking at that six feet and the six feet is still what the CDC is sticking to. And as we discussed before with influenza, before the swine flu, it was three feet. We know that if you cough and sneeze, your droplets will go farther. So, so six feet is where a decision was made for public health to, uh, uh, to social distance people. Uh, now, that, that plus the masks makes it extremely unlikely that someone is going to sneeze, someone who's infected. Sneezing, as we've discussed, is one of the most efficient ways to spread virus. It's, I don't know how that evolved, but boy, the virus must be so happy to go on those droplets. Um, and we know what the size of the droplets are. So the new information, which is not necessarily relevant to contagiousness, is that if you, if you get someone to sneeze and you now can chart exactly what the particle size is, and how far it goes, uh, sure, there are circumstances where you can have champion sneezers who will go, you know, six, eight feet, nine feet, and I think we all, we all realize that. But the farther you are from the person, the fewer viruses are actually in that cloud. And at a certain point, you have so few viruses that even if you have one or two and one or two land on you, that's not enough to cause a productive infection in a person who gets inoculated. And you and I have talked about the fact that there are people who are PCR positive with minimal exposures whose blood tests never turn positive and it's as though they actually never got infected. So yes, I can easily see where someone says six feet isn't enough. And the six feet, as you recall, was before we had facial coverings. Mm -hmm. So if you include the facial coverings, which we're all doing, uh, plus the six feet, I'm still really comfortable that we're not going to spread it. it the closer you get, the higher your risk is. I, like you, you see people who are out in groups, with, even with masks on, who are right next to each other. And boy, if you sneeze and you're right next to, uh, there's gonna be a few particles that get around that facial covering. So to answer your question, uh, I don't think that the nine feet research is actually relevant to contagiousness, even though you can find particles. And we discussed a particle aerosolizer that showed that the particles could hang in the air for hours. And that was in a, in a protected chamber. That's not like outside where there's wind blowing. So, so people are trying to look at what limits you need for distancing and the masks. And right now, the public health authorities and the majority of researchers believe that the masks and six feet should, should prevent spread. So it's rare, unlikely, being looked at, which would then bring me to my next question because we've been talking about this for a few weeks, this rare disease that's been popping up in the children. Uh, we talked about, we talked here actually with Ready Children's Hospital and the Kawasaki and um, had a conversation about that, but it's now from what we're seeing, very rare cases popping up in 20 year olds and teenagers, still rare. But when yes. a parent hears this, they go into panic mode that, what about my child? Okay, um, I want to answer that question because it's a really good one, but there's several components if I can break, break them all apart. 
Uh, I hope it's not too long of an answer, but it's very important. Uh, I want to distinguish between the active virus infection, where some child gets it, they get the runny nose, the congested fever, a little bit of cough, and you can find lots of virus on them. That's the acute infection with the virus. In adults, that leads to hospitalizations. In children, we still, in our ICU in the past two months, have had one baby who also had heart disease uh, where the chambers of the heart were, were not all put together right. And that baby had a hard time breathing and was, was positive. And that baby did really well, didn't even need treatment with any antiviral. So in all of San Diego for two months, and we've had excellent means to test by the PCR, the, the nasal swab, we've only had one in the ICU. So I want people to not worry still that the virus itself, as it causes an infection, <clears throat> excuse me, leads to serious illness in children. Now, what's coming out now is that, is that up a week to up to three or four weeks after the infection, as the child's immunity system reacts to the virus, wherever it went in the body, you begin to see pockets of inflammation in different areas of the body. Uh, belly pain and diarrhea turns out to be the most common symptom of this other disease entity. So I'm separating them out. Uh, the conference call I was on this morning with the National Institutes of Health and the FDA, they're now separating it out for clinical trials because there's a different treatment for the virus and a different treatment for the post-infection inflammatory syndrome that the CDC is calling MISC, the, the Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome dash children. Uh, and that is now um, uh, being studied more intensely. Uh, and many of the cases are in New York City and Washington, DC. So the treatment for that isn't an antivirus medicine. It's the, it's the medicines we used as a switch to turn off the immune system, which is intravenous immune globulin, which is the classic treatment for Kawasaki's disease, which we believe is something that occurs after an infection, but we still don't know what, what infection triggers that. Does the coronavirus, this infection, cause this inflammation? Yes, as your, and I've got a great analogy for you. You've heard of of rheumatic heart disease, right? That, you know, described a hundred years ago. You get strep throat and then weeks later, your heart gets all inflamed and your valves are irritated and you can't pump blood correctly. Your body thinks that there's still strep bacteria in the heart valves and in the heart itself and your body's attacking its own tissues. Very uncommon, only with certain strains and only with certain children. So, but we've known about this for a for hundred years uh, and not everyone with strep throat gets this. We, every, we treat them all with penicillin just so that they don't. But um, using that as a model that you can get an infection and then your body clears it but then goes overboard and keeps thinking that it's infected, that's what this MISC is. There's no more virus. Um, and if you do the test for antibody, for immunity, you find most of these kids actually have immunity. But their reaction is an overreaction. It's not just clearing the virus and all is well. They keep, they keep reacting. And we don't know exactly what causes that, but that's enough to bring kids back into the hospital. And, and many of them come in with persisting fevers and belly pain uh, and aren't so sick. A few of them come in uh, uh, with, with persisting fevers and difficulty breathing, but the virus isn't there. And, and a few of them in other parts of the country, not in San Diego, end up in the intensive care unit with something that looks like heart failure, similar to Kawasaki disease, but a bit different and the critical care doctors are taking care of all of those kids. And even in New York City and Washington, D.C., 
I think of all the children that have had it, thousands of kids, there's only been one death. So, so if parents bring their kids in when they're sick, and if they get hospitalized, they can be managed and they get over this. So two syndromes, the, the acute infection and then the post-inflammatory syndrome. Now, to make it more confusing, <laughs> as, though, as though that's not confusing enough, okay. uh, in, in New York and Washington, D.C., the hospitalization rate there, even though they have greater disease, is, is 50 to 100 times ours. Way more kids hospitalized. And it's, you know, the general population mix is roughly the same in New York, Washington, and San Diego. And we, we have not understood why so many of the kids there are getting sicker, and we don't see it in San Diego. And, and there's some preliminary data that, that uh, uh, a infectious disease doctor in Washington, D.C., who's the head of their children's hospital program, believes it's, it's the European strain of coronavirus causes worse disease compared to the China strain of coronavirus that we have on the West Coast that doesn't cause as bad a disease. So, so as we work with FDA and companies, not only are they going to have to figure out whether it's virus or inflammation, they're going to have to figure out whether it's the, the China strain or the European strain, because all of our kids will do well whatever treatment we give them. And so we don't want a drug being approved that was only tested in California uh, and then be used in New York City. So, so that's, that's breaking news that, that now is beginning to play out. Uh, but it can, it can explain why we're so lucky in San Diego to not have such severe disease and to not have more kids hospitalized. We, we've, diagnosed, we've diagnosed disease in, in 120 kids, positive tests in children coming in, and only 13 of them have even been in the hospital. And, and they all did really well. We've only treated one with an antiviral because they were sick enough, one 13-year-old girl who, who, who actually was on drugs that suppressed her immunity system. So we're so lucky in San Diego. I don't, I, I, I knock on wood, I hope it continues. But, uh, but we now are getting some insights in why other parts of the world have so much of a harder time with this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But we're, we're, we're not letting down our guard. Our, our ward, our, our special infectious disease ward is still up and running. We've got special rooms in the ICU just waiting for children. And, um, and we've just not seen them come in yet. I'm just curious, how are there two different strains? I, I'm just not a doctor. And I, I know all these people who are not doctors and not specialists, they, they have their own theories and they try to explain all of this stuff, but I, I'm just a fan of getting it from people who went to school to study and understand right. this. Okay, okay. <laughs> how are there two different strains and how does, I mean, there's people that have gone from New York to California, California, New York, like. I know. I don't, I don't get it. Well, it's, it's whatever. So let, the, the first question is different strains. This is, this is an RNA virus, but it, but it has enzymes which check, check to make sure that as it replicates itself, it replicates true. And other viruses like HIV, when they replicate, there's nothing to make sure it's true. And the number of mutations is huge. So influenza is somewhere in between. Influenza mutates, and that's why we need a new vaccine every year. Okay? And some years, the flu is worse than others mm -hmm. because some of these mutations cause more virulence. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a swine flu was fairly bad. The bird flu, which never made it to the United States, had a mortality rate of 20 to 30 percent. The bird flu, that was a mutation. So a mutation alters the way a virus uh, grows in the body and alters the way a host responds to it. So, so you can get a small mutation which makes, which makes the disease more severe. And potentially, not only does it make more, the disease more severe with the infection, but it's also possible that that mutation will also lead to a higher rate of post-infection inflammation. And so you get more disease 
a month after the infection as well. We're, everyone is looking at this now. We don't, that it's, this, is, this is a good hypothesis. It hasn't been proven. A lot of people are going to be looking at it. But, but you and I have struggled with why we don't have an outbreak here. And I keep saying, and have from the beginning, it seems to be pretty mild. And, and people are then quoting what's happening in New York. This isn't mild, this is, this is killing people. It's like, not for children in San Diego. And, and at least that consistent message is still true here. And, and we're trying to figure out why things are different on the East Coast. I know things change day to day, every hour to hour. Uh, we've been here several times to talk to you, knowing what we know now as things are starting to open up and people are going to restaurants and, and the stores are starting to open. With the information, Dr. Bradley, that you have as of today, what do you foresee happening in the next month or two? If you could have a little magic ball and you look into it, what would be your educated guess? I think, I think the, uh, the measures in place with social distancing and the masks as onerous as they are, and I don't like them any more than anybody else, have, have really limited the spread. And data coming out of San Diego County every day, and we look at it every day, shows that, that the spread is in check, decreasing. The rate of positive tests now is below 5%. And so what we're doing is working. And, and I think it's very reasonable to do this measured let things up and see how, see how things go. So I wanted to take my wife to a restaurant and she said, no way, I'm staying home. So we're not going to a restaurant. But she would be comfortable to go. I would be comfortable to go because I think those very strict guidelines that you've seen that the county is making every restaurant follow and they post them so everyone knows what to expect. Uh, they're onerous, but they prevent people from spreading the virus. So I'm, I, think, I think that kind of staged comeback is very reasonable, but the vaccine is going to be necessary before we can really uh, stop doing any of the masks and social distancing. And there are now companies uh, who are projecting, three of them, that they will have back vaccine by September, October. And I know when I first said January, that was like, oh, it can't be that early because they were saying it'll be two years. But the technology is so phenomenal uh, that the ability to, to create novel vaccines that look like they'll produce immunity and those data are already coming out. With this vaccine that you can scale up to production to hundreds of thousands to millions of doses within a month or two, um, that technology is here. And so if the vaccines are safe, because we need to, to, to check it in thousands of people, and they're protective, then, then as early as this fall, we'll all be lining up <laughs> to get our vaccines. Is that possible? I hear so many experts say you need time, you so, need time. So let me, let me qualify that. Sorry, this is more than the questions that I wanted to it's ask. Great, no, they're, they're great questions. Uh, there, there are three components of a vaccine. They, you give it and you need to make sure that there's a response of the body against the virus that you believe uh, uh, will neutralize the virus if you get exposed to it. There's safety. We want to make sure that, you know, people that get this, 10% of them don't come down with this, this uh, post-infection inflammatory syndrome. Uh, and then the third is protective efficacy. So when you have a thousand people who are all immunized, and then you track someone with COVID who gets into a group of people who are immunized, and you see if the immunized people come down with disease or not, that, that is the highest bar. That protective efficacy is, is what has been traditional for all vaccines before they're released. So do you produce a response? That's immunogenicity. Is it safe? And is there protective efficacy? So the first two, you can actually accumulate with a few thousand people. And, and the current 
three companies are currently geared up to do between 10 and 30,000 people in that phase of study. And there's, they're going for it. So the most massive immunization program ever seen in human history. But the other part, does it work? That's the part that generally takes a year or two. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the emergency situation we're in here, the FDA has the ability to do an emergency use authorization, an EUA, to allow the companies to use the vaccines, assuming that they'll continue to track how well they, that they work. So this isn't an approval. This is a, this is a hall pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then a few years later, if, it, if they all work the way that they're supposed to, then they'll be approved. But, uh, but because of the national emergency, the FDA has the ability to release these products earlier than they normally do. And that's why the antiviral remdesivir uh, was given EUA approval. And we've got some in our pharmacy right now. And it's working. And it's working. Wow. Anything else, Dr. Bradley, that has popped up over the past week or two, information that would be helpful to anybody? Um, I, I, I want, I want your friends to know that, that there's a huge amount of interest in protecting children and figuring out why kids get sick. And this isn't just sort of a local thing or a California thing. It, the United States, the Centers for Disease Control, the NIH, companies are involved. Everyone is on the same page. Everyone wants to make sure that the kids do well. Not only is this a US effort, there's a European effort, and they actually started before we do. There's a global registry. I can register any child who's admitted here with, with coronavirus infection mm -hmm. in a global registry in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so the harmonization of brilliant people all across the world, all of whom take care of children, all these minds are being concentrated on solving this problem. And so for any parent that's worried, we are in a point in human history where we can bring such incredible resources to solve this problem. And children are our most valued you know, parts of the population and we want to protect them. And I believe with all of this effort, we'll get some answers and we'll be able to protect them. Thank you for your time again, Dr. Bradley. Thank it's you. It's invaluable. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to It Is What It Is with Shali Zomorodi. You can join in and ask your questions live on Shali's Facebook or Instagram page. You can find so much more by following Shali on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and by visiting shaldi.com.